Today, Wix Engineering is hosting uh, Dr. Martin Klettmann from the University of Cambridge, an esteemed researcher and teacher, author of the distinguished uh, book, uh, Designing Data Intensive uh, Applications, and uh, gifted speaker and blogger. So uh, welcome, Dr. Klettmann. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm a big fan of your work ever since I watched the uh, talk on conflict resolution for eventual consistency from go to Berlin 2016 conference and uh, you were able to explain such complex subjects with great clarity patience and thoroughness um, which I really admire so thanks oh, again thank you for your kind words <laughs> thank you um, so uh, you wrote a, a wonderful book uh, designing data intensive applications can you talk a little bit about uh, what are the main challenges of building modern day distributed data systems? Yeah, I would say probably the biggest challenge is that there are just so many different tools available to choose from. And it's difficult to figure out which tools you would use for what purpose. Uh, you know, people say like, choose the right tool for the job, but how do you know which tool is actually the right one for your particular job? Um, and that's really what I tried to address in this book because, um, I don't think like people ask me like, can you make a flowchart where you ask five simple questions and it tells you, you should pick this database. Um, and I tried to, and I realized that it just wasn't possible to do that because the questions you have to ask require so much background thinking and, you know, so, so much knowledge of what questions to ask and how to ask them and what, what the question actually means. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what I then tried to get across in this book is like trying to teach the reader what questions you should be asking of your own systems in order to figure out what what aspects you need, what things you don't need, and therefore then which systems might be appropriate for your particular task. Um, I see, great. And um, so can you um, give an example of a specific um, um, answer you have uh, for a question that um, a reader will have and how you answer it? You yeah, know what, what I mean? Yeah, well, so one, one thing that comes up, for example, is you get SQL databases for all sorts of different things. And you might think that, well, one SQL database is interchangeable with a different SQL database because they use the same query language. Uh, but actually, no, like there, you get very different databases that are very optimized for totally different use cases. And that's not apparent at all from the query language. Um, mm. So like one subdivision I make in the book, which is, I think like any categorization, it's not perfect, but at least as a first approximation, you can divide systems into transaction processing systems and analytics systems. Um, and they tend to have very different access patterns. So the transaction processing systems will usually have lots of very small read write transactions, which each change like a small number of records in the database. On the other hand, you've got the analytic systems where most of your data writing is like bulk loads, bulk imports from some other data source. And most of your querying is very large queries that have to scan through a huge number of different rows. And like, depending on which of those two you are, you would you make totally different design decisions in terms of how you lay out the data on disk, uh, how the query plan gets executed, how you distribute the database across multiple machines. Um, you know, everything changes depending on what that access pattern is. And, and so like, that's one of the high level questions I think I, I try to get across. And then by showing also like, what are the consequences of that design decision? Um, how do you lay out the data if you want it for a transaction processing versus how do you lay, out, lay it out if it's for analytics? Like the, the data layouts look entirely different. That's very helpful uh, when you're designing uh, your application. Um, so the book was published in 2017. Mm -hmm. Any new scientific breakthroughs in this field since then? Uh, well, I mean, there's there's always new stuff happening. Um, as you know, the tech industry is extremely passion, extremely fashion driven, where like it's always like, oh, we have the the base, best, amazing, biggest new thing that is going to change everything. And often, if you strip away the layers of marketing there and look at the fundamentals, you realize that actually not that much has changed. Often, you know, there's, there's a nugget of a new idea or two, which is kind of interesting, uh, but it's not really the paradigm change that people make it out to be. And, and so for that reason, I think I'm 
because my book looks at the fundamentals and tries to strip away all of the marketing stuff, um, it's actually hasn't gone out of date very much um, because the fundamentals are pretty slow changing. Mm -hmm. They do, you know, occasionally changes happen. So like one fundamental change, for example, that has happened is non-volatile memory. Uh, so we've gone from spinning disks to SSDs and now increasingly to, to non-volatile memory. Um, and that's a fundamental change, but I'm not sure it's really percolated very much into the architecture of the practical systems we use nowadays. Um, so, so I think it's interesting to look at those sort of underlying trends, but also realize that you know a lot of database architecture is still essentially based on the spinning disk model uh, from the 1970s, and um, and a lot of the systems we use are still based around that assumption. And so, so you know, maybe in in 10 years' time, it'll the technology shifts gradually and build up. Maybe a shift to more. Uh... Completely memory-based solutions, perhaps. For example, yes. So maybe keep everything in memory. That, that's, I mean, there are a bunch of systems that do that already, and uh, that can be a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, there, another trend is maybe that um, more companies are now comfortable using hosted cloud-based data storage systems rather than running their own systems on their own hardware. Um, that's sort of, that, that does change the way the people interact with these systems. And it means that some of the operational stuff is taken care of for you because like maybe backups, for example, are just done by your infrastructure provider, by the cloud provider, and you don't have to worry about maintaining your own backup configuration. Um, but I think even if you're just a software engineer building applications using cloud services, I think you still need to figure out which cloud service you would use for which task um, because just with self-hosted systems, not every service is appropriate for every kind of workload. Um, so, so I think you still need to know a bit about what is going on internally in the services so that you can figure out which service you would use in which circumstances. Um, I mean, like I, I used to work in a startup um, back in 2012, we were using host Heroku Postgres, which was a hosted uh, cloud hosted Postgres service and you know that was great we didn't have to do the operations for it ourselves and pretty quickly as our data set grew we realized that actually no we we did actually need quite a lot of insight into why was this particular query slow why is our latency suddenly spiking at a particular time of day um and in a cloud cloud hosted system well you, you tend to not really have have very much insight into what's going on because you know you you can't see what is the the hit rate on my file system page cache, for example, because, well, sorry, you don't have access to those system level metrics. Right. Um, so, so I think for the, you know, if you've got a small scale application that that fits easily on any type of system, then it's not a problem. But if, if you're pushing the boundaries and you've got a large amount of data or it's very fast changing or otherwise it's a challenging system, then I think even with cloud systems, you still have to actually look underneath the covers a bit sometimes and like if, if you want to debug why something is slow for example absolutely um let's uh, talk about um consistency in databases mm -hmm. so can you explain a little bit about the different levels of uh, data consistency we have eventual consistency you mentioned in the book uh, linearizability and trade-offs between them mm -hmm. well i mean that's a very big topic and uh there's a whole zoo of different consistency models that, that have been proposed and that are used. Um, I think one of the most fundamental is probably um, between the types of consistency model that require synchronous coordination and those which don't. Um, that is sometimes phrased in terms of the CAP theorem. So like you can have the systems that are available and partition tolerant in the sense of the CAP theorem or consistent and partition tolerant. Um, and that that fault line is, it, it's not perfect, but it, it does very roughly group the world into two, two separate um, group families of systems and consistency models. And, um, and so linearizability is, is on the strong side uh, of that. So that's uh, essentially linearizability means that uh, whenever you read or write some data, the data you see is the most up-to-date 
version of the data. So the system behaves as a whole as if there was only a single up-to-date copy of the data, even though in reality it might be replicated. There might be multiple copies of the data in different places. Um, so could we think uh, we can uh, rely on modern databases to provide strong consistency, like linear instability? Um, it it uh, depends entirely on the, the setting that you're running in. So, so one example I like to use is, say, the calendar app on your phone. Um, that is essentially a database. It's a database containing some entries in your calendar. And you probably want to sync that with your computer as well. So you've got copies of your calendar on your phone and on your computer. Now, what happens if um, you are somewhere in a place where you don't have cellular data reception, like somewhere in the middle of a supermarket or somewhere, and you want to, you think of something, you put something in your calendar. Um, now, you still want to be able to update your calendar, even though your phone is not connected to the internet, right? So you want to be able to write to this database at any time, even if it's disconnected from the entire world, which means that obviously, like right after you have written a new entry to the calendar on your phone, that's not going to be on your computer because your phone and your computer haven't had a chance to synchronize with each other yet right. because the phone has been offline. And so in that case, you don't want linearizability because if you did have linearizability, it would mean you can't add anything to your calendar if your phone is disconnected from the internet because otherwise you would be violating the principle of, of linearizability that every client sees this up-to-date version of the data. Right. So in that case, you definitely do not want linearizability. That's the last thing you want. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that example, I think, just shows that there is no one model that is appropriate for, for all circumstances. Like if you're within a single data center, all of you, you're only talking about machines within a single data center, within a single geographic region, then often achieving linearizability in that context is feasible because you know, the network is fast, the communication is fairly reliable. You know, occasionally network outages happen in a data center, but it's not that common. So, so in that case, linearizability is fine. But clearly in the, in the phone app case, it's not fine. But even if you have, say, multiple data centers across different geographic regions, then already linearizability would mean, well, anytime you want to write something in one data center, you have to coordinate with at least several of the other data centers. Um, and that would slow down every single operation that you make. And so, you know, is, is it worth that trade-off? Well, it, you know, it depends. Uh, depends what you want. But um, it might be for some apps, but for other apps that you say, no, actually, we'll rather tolerate a lower level of consistency and have it go faster or have it be more reliable in the case of network interruptions. Right. So uh, your example of updating uh, the calendar on the phone, uh, naturally, just to... Uh, Talk about uh, one of your main areas of research as conflict-free, conflict-free replicated data types (CRDTs). Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about what are CRDTs? And what are the problems uh, that they are trying to solve? Really? Yeah. So we are looking at how you build collaboration software, and this is quite a broad concept of collaboration software. So anything where several devices or several users may have a copy of some data and might be contributing to that in some way. And the calendar app would be one example. Uh, another example would be something like Google Docs, where you can have several people editing a document at the same time, uh, or a shared spreadsheet, or you know, it could be more specialized applications like several architects working together on the building plans for a building. Um, you know, any, anything where there are several people contributing to some, some shared file or some shared data set. And in those types of apps, um, like in the calendar app example, usually you want each user to be able to operate on their own copy of the data on their own computer. Um, because if you have to go over the internet, do a round trip over the internet for every single user interaction, every single character that the user types in their document, it would get really slow. So you want, um, you want each user to be able to update their own copy uh, immediately without waiting for communication with the rest of the world. In, you might even want a user to be able to work offline entirely while they're disconnected from the internet. And you know, some collaborative apps allow some degree of offline working as well. But if you have this sort of several users updating at the same time without waiting for each other, that means that different users' views of this document or this shared data are going to diverge a bit. So they're going to end up with slightly inconsistent views of this data. And what CRDTs do 
is provide us with a mechanism for getting everybody back in sync again, getting everyone back into a consistent state in a way that doesn't lose any user's inputs, but that preserves all of the changes that different users have made, but merges them together in a way that everyone is guaranteed to end up with a consistent view of the document at the end. Right. And um, in your talks on CRDTs, you presented the, the auto marriage library. Um, and there were different uh, stages of uh, maturity along the years. Uh, can you share the state of it nowadays? Um, interesting production use cases? Yeah, yeah, AutoMerge is, is a really exciting project. Um, so that's been in the works for a couple of years, as you said. And we are just in the process of uh, shipping a 1.0 release. Uh, oh, so, so that is exciting time. So we've um, between the 0 0.x uh, release series and the 1.0, uh, we have made a lot of breaking changes. And so we've collected together all of the breaking changes that we want to make into this, this 1.0 release. In particular, we've changed the data formats to be a lot more compact. Um, so now rather than using JSON, which gets extremely verbose, uh, we're using a, a compressed binary data format for storing data on disk and for sending it to other users over the network. Um, we've updated the APIs to be nicer. Um, and at the moment, I'm doing a lot of work on performance as well. Um, we've also updated the network protocols uh, to be more robust and uh, and allow, like, um, ensure that the data synchronization between different devices always works in, in a way that's performant but uh, robust. Um, and so those uh, we've made a lot of progress in in all those areas, and we are current. We have currently shipped a like preview release of 1.0, um, which means that it's not totally nailed down yet. But the intention is that the APIs and the data formats and the network protocols are all stable now, and they're not going to change. And we've put in uh, forward and backward compatibility mechanisms, so it means we can add new features uh, in the future without breaking the data formats, and so. Like you can have different users using different versions of the software and they can still interoperate. Um, we've put a lot of thought into that. So, so that's been coming along very nicely and uh, we're going to put the finishing touches on that and, and ship a 1.0 release hopefully in, in the next month or two. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's great. I, uh, it uh, hints at the maturity and uh, non-breaking changes. So. Uh, hopefully, a much higher adoption and and uh, uh, around the around the world. That's great news. Yes. Uh, well, the, so the one area that still needs work is the performance at the moment. So at the moment, if you have large amounts of data, auto merge can get quite slow. Um, and so that is an area for which we have various things in progress. Um, so one of our efforts there has actually been to take the JavaScript implementation and rewrite the core of it in Rust. Uh, which we can then compile to WebAssembly and still use in a web browser. But also the Rust is it's much nicer if you want to build native iOS apps, for example, since we can just compile it to native code, wrap it with a Swift library, and then you can use it there. We can uh, also use it from Java or Kotlin and make Android apps and so on. So it's it's really great for like uh, cross-platform functionality. And oh. so uh, also, of course, using Rust allows us to achieve higher performance than we can uh, in JavaScript, um, but also part of the performance work comes from using better data structures, uh, which are independent of the language that you're using. Interesting. Um, so um, in uh, 2018, um, you gave a, a keynote at Kafka Summit on, is Kafka a database? Mm -hmm. Given the past streaming platforms are headed to, do you still see a uh, convergence between uh, the two concepts of streaming and database? Oh yeah, there's definitely um, they've they've converged a lot over the last few years, and that's very encouraging to see. Um, in particular, the integration of getting data out of databases and into streaming systems that has got a lot better with uh, change data capture systems like DBCM, for example. Um, so I think that allows us to use streaming systems that augment existing databases rather than replacing databases wholesale. Um, and then the streaming systems have themselves gained like database-like capabilities by allowing you to define uh, stream processing queries using SQL, for example. 
uh, like uh, KSQLDB or, or Materialize are examples of that. Um, I still feel there's there's a lot more still to be unlocked there, which people are not quite getting at yet. Um, so I, I gave this talk uh, back, like, I can't remember when it was, probably 2014 or something like that, called uh, Turning the Database Inside Out. Right. And in that talk, I speculated a bit about what it would look like if we really orient, reorientate the way we think about databases around a streaming model. Right. And and some of that has happened, but but there are also a bunch of things that that like haven't really been addressed yet. So in particular, the way that uh, a lot of services and you know business logic apps are still built is still very much a kind of request response model where. Sure. You, you query the system, please give me the state right now, you get a response, and then that's it. So if the response later changes because some underlying data in the service changes, you don't get notified. You don't get told, hey, uh, I've now got an update to the response I gave you earlier. You should now update your your underlying, your, your view of onto this data as well. No, like you can poll for changes, of course. You can just keep repeating the query, but that's pretty inefficient, um, and it's and it means your your delay in getting any updates is your polling interval, so which uh, is probably too long to be used for any like low latency type use cases. So, um, so you know what you can do now is package up your business logic as a stream processor, um, and then you get this sort of low latency notification type data flow. But that's still a very different mode from working compared to like the sort of microservices style. REST API style um, mm -hmm. services that, that people are mostly building. And so I, I think there's still a lot more to be done in making the services that people build respond to data changes rather than just respond to queries. Right. Uh, I think uh, the adoption of this architecture and style is gaining traction as, as the years pass, I think. So. Uh, Yes, yes, but it's it's a big change, and so it's it's very understandable yeah. that it takes a long time for those kind of things to to actually percolate through into the everyday practice. Right, that's a paradigm shift, like moving to functional programming and stuff. Like that. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, um, what do you think about Kafka's move to rely on the Raft algorithm for consensus and leader election instead of Zookeeper? Oh, for Kafka, that makes perfect sense, and um, and I I think. Kafka, the team has wanted to do that for a very long time because Zookeeper has always been a bit of a troublesome part of the Kafka ecosystem. Um, I, I will note that what is the right decision for Kafka is not necessarily the right decision for everybody else. So just because Kafka has implemented its own consensus protocol does not mean that everyone else should be giving up Zookeeper. Uh, I think Kafka is very much a special case there because what they have, that the Kafka data model is an append-only log that is replicated with consistency guarantees around this log itself. And that is itself a consensus protocol. That they've had, in some sense, a consensus protocol since day one. It's totally inherent in what Kafka is doing anyway. Mm -hmm. And so like putting a bit of raft on top of that is is entirely reasonable thing for Kafka to do. Um, since Raft also produces a log. So it's essentially just a bit of detail around how you do the leader election and so on. Um, but but this doesn't mean that Zookeeper is bad. Zookeeper still makes a lot of sense for uh, other types of systems that need to do this kind of coordination, which don't have this existing log infrastructure to rely on. Um, and so for those things, I, I would still entirely use Zookeeper. Right, uh, but if you do have Kafka uh, uh, deployed in your production system, maybe you can use that some, sometimes as a leader election mechanism by itself, uh, using topics and partitions. And, and uh, yes, possibly. You um, you have to be quite careful with exactly what you're doing there. Um, the, the Kafka team has some very excellent distributed systems engineers. Um, and you know they they are up to date with the research on consensus protocols. They are using some formal uh, formal methods to verify the correctness of their protocols and so on. Uh, so you know they they really know what they're doing. Um, it's it's easy to stumble into this kind of thing and um, 
And if you're not totally up to date with all the things that can go wrong, you can easily make mistakes that mean your system is no longer uh, guaranteed the properties that you were hoping it would guarantee. Um, so so I, I will just like caution that it's 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 a difficult area to get right. It's, it's certainly possible to get it right, but um, it's not entirely straightforward. Right, it's a complicated subject, uh, consensus, consensus algorithms. Mm. Um, so uh, how is your impact different in uh, the academic world where you publish papers and uh, lectures uh, of course, courses um, versus your role in uh, industry as advisor that you had uh, to companies and startups such as, uh, as Confluent, if you're talking about Kafka? It's, um, well, I, I can still keep the connections to industry and I can still advise people. Um, I'm, I'm not doing very much of that at the moment just because I feel like my time is better spent um, at the moment doing fundamental research and publishing it. Um, but it's nice to know that you know that that door is is always still open. Um, I I'm enjoying more academia more than I thought I would when I moved from industry to academia. I think um, I'm I'm very much enjoying the freedom to just work on problems that I think are important um, without having to worry about you know is this going to be a commercially viable product or something like that. I can just do stuff that I think is worthwhile. I can freely publish everything that I do. You know, I don't have to get any approvals from anyone about from the PR department about whether I'm allowed to say something or not. I can just publish anything I like, which is wonderful. I can just if every code bit of code that I write is just open source by default. You know, I don't even bother setting the GitHub repo to private because why bother? I you know just work open source. Uh, that's a very nice position to be in, and I I, I feel privileged to. Um, be able to do that. Um, there's there's like an interesting tension between how much do I focus on writing code versus how much do I focus on writing papers, and and those are both useful I think because like clearly with open source code it's closer to being in a state where somebody can just take it and use it and and build upon it. Um, on the other hand, I, I've had a couple of nice experiences where. I wrote a paper explaining some ideas. I didn't have time necessarily to actually implement it all. I just, you know, wrote down my state of thinking, published it, and then other people came and picked it up, and other people then took the ideas and implemented them, um, potentially in ways that I wouldn't have even thought of myself. And in that way, then I feel actually that's a very nice form of impact as well, because if um, if I was only publishing open source code, then well, there would be that one implementation that people could use. But if that implementation doesn't exactly do what they want, they would end up having to re-implement it and they'd end up reinventing a whole bunch of stuff. Whereas with the paper, I can actually lay out like precisely what are the trade-offs, what are the, the options here, um, what are the fundamental ideas of the algorithm. And then if somebody wants to pick that up, they're welcome to use it. They can implement it in whatever way they like. Um, and I've had a couple of examples of that where uh, you know, somebody comes to me uh, and asks me like, hey, I've been thinking about this problem. Do you have any ideas? And I go, oh, it just happens that I drafted a paper on that very topic three months ago. Let me send you the PDF file. And that's it. Like I, I just hand it over to them and they have essentially the documentation ready that they need in order to, to use the ideas for themselves. And so that has worked surprisingly well, actually, that um, I, I found people will, will take the ideas from papers uh, that I've written and just run with them and do their own implementations. And that's wonderful. That sounds great. Um, you recently set up uh, crowdfunding uh, mm -hmm. through Patreon. Um, what was the motivation behind uh, this decision? It was mainly an experiment, really, to uh, just to see if this is something that could work. Like Patreon, I guess, is best known for like musicians and artists, uh, that sort of type of person. Um, to support for fans to be able to support their work in in a, some kind of sustainable way, and I was interested. Like, does this work also for computer science research and uh, for teaching? Um, so far, it's, it has worked surprisingly well. I think the um, the level of support I'm getting from Patreon is now getting close to the salary I'm getting from the university, um, and. Salary I'm getting from the university is comes from a research grant, and I have to apply to get that research grant myself. And that research grant only lasts for a fixed amount of time. In my case, it's a three-year grant. 
and I've still got a bit over one year left on that grant. So I know that my job at the university is just going to evaporate in a bit over a year's time uh, if my grant runs out and I haven't figured out some follow-on funding uh, for that. And so, you know, it's writing grant proposals can be useful because, you know, it forces you to articulate your ideas and explain why the ideas are important and explain how you're going to realize those ideas and so on. Um, but also writing grant proposals can be a huge time sink. Mm -hmm. And and so I was curious, you know, would something like Patreon work as a way where, you know, it still work because I still have to, uh, I still write monthly updates for my Patreon supporters, for example, where I explain like, what have I been up to? Uh, what have I done in the last month? Um, and that takes a bit of time as well, but also it's a good thing to do anyway, because, you know, it's nice to reflect on on what has happened and what has gone well and what could be better and so on. Um, so I wouldn't say like Patreon is a totally passive income screen. It, it does require some some effort as well, just like applying for a grant requires some effort. But uh, it does seem like it's, it's possible to make this work as a sustainable uh, form of income that then doesn't have this cliff edge that after three years it, it suddenly ends. Um, because I think most Patreon supporters seem to realize that that like they're, they're buying into something long term here. The expectation is that hopefully you will be a supporter for several years. Um, and and that you know, gives, gives me a bit more planning horizon because uh, it, it means that I have some certainty that I can keep continuing doing the work that I'm doing, even if I don't manage to bring in another grant. Uh, it's, it allows me to, to know that, okay, there's, there's a level of security here uh, which, which is a, a wonderful thing to have. Um, the, the question is like, how well would this generalize um, to other people as well? And that, right. that is difficult to say because of course I only have one single data point, which is myself to go by. Um, I have seen a few other uh, friends who are computer scientists who've managed to make Patreon work for themselves and build up a, a sustainable level uh, of income through it. Um, in my case, of course, like I have a fairly substantial social media following and so on. So I, I can use that to point people at the fact that I have this Patreon thing. I don't know if this would work as well if I didn't have as many Twitter followers or such like, um, or if I hadn't written a fairly high profile book. So I, I kind of wish that this principle will work for other researchers as well, because I think it's... Um, it can be a, a really nice way of working. One thing that I particularly like about it actually is that for the people who've signed up to support me, uh, you know, even if it's just like $5 a month, they are investing their own personal money in the work that I'm doing. And so because this, it means it's a community of people who are excited about the stuff that I'm working on. And I feel like I can now then engage with that community and I know that they're interested because they are invested in it, literally. Um, and so, the, you know, these are people I can bounce ideas off. Uh, these are people who I can send early drafts of my work to and ask for feedback. Um, and so just beyond the money, that is actually a, a really wonderful thing to have that sort of community of people who really care about the work you're doing. Uh, that's a very interesting model of, of working and uh, uh, contributing. Um, so uh, one final question. Um, mm -hmm. You recently published several blog posts uh, on the rules, explicit and implicit, governing the virtual world, uh, ranging from content moderation to open source licenses. Can you explain a little bit about your personal philosophy in this area? Uh, yes, well, it's difficult, I guess, is the, the one word summary. Um, you know, in the early days of the internet, people had this really utopian idea. Like, think in the 90s or so, um, there was this idea that the internet would transcend all national borders, that we would all be one happy community worldwide, everybody together. Uh, if you think about, like, Barlow's Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace from, from the mid-90s, um, that was this whole idea that, you know, national governments are irrelevant and national laws are irrelevant because everything in the internet is worldwide. And if we look at that now, 25 years later, I think disillusionment has set in and we've realized that actually that's it, that utopian ideal really hasn't been realized at all. 
uh, in fact, totally to the contrary, most of the the spaces we now have to communicate over the internet are controlled by big corporations like Facebook. Um, they are corporations like Facebook are beholden only to their shareholders and to nobody else. You know, at least a government in at least a democratic state will have some legitimacy from the fact that the people have voted um, and elected them. Whereas Facebook is not elected by anybody. Um, the Facebook board is elected by the shareholders. They're, those are the only people who have a say, really. Um, and and beyond that, it's just, you know, kind of like a... Uh, the, the, the corporation can decide to do things in whatever whatever way it likes. And I feel that's a, a deeply unsatisfying situation to be in. Um, but it's not obvious how you solve that either, because, like, I, I think... You know, I, I believe very much in democracy, and I believe that um, that in the end, like the, the legitimacy of any power should come from the people. But people don't always agree. Uh, fundamentally, like in, in different parts of the world, people have different value systems, for example, and uh, there's disagreement in like things that are legal in one country are not legal in another country, and and that extends very much to like what speech is allowed. Um, like say Holocaust denial is is prohibited, is uh, illegal in Germany and a number of other European countries, but it's not illegal in the US, for example. And so, or, or the things that you're allowed to say in China will not be the same as the things that you're allowed to say in Israel, because, you know, it's a different uh, political system, it's a different legal system and different value system. And so, like, it doesn't seem possible to have one single worldwide agreement on what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. Um, but at the same time, like just making it free for all that anyone is allowed to say anything doesn't seem great as well, because, you know, if you have any platform where you're allowed to say anything, it's just going to get overrun by extremists who are going to use it to do a lot of horrible things. Um, and, and like, I think there is a, a duty of, um, the technologists who build social media systems, uh, to ensure that, you know, they're somehow working towards the good. And I think that means that certain things have to be not acceptable. And you have to, people will have to debate what things are acceptable and what not. Like, a, my personal opinion would be like that far right extremism is, ne is not acceptable. And we should find mechanism for not allowing that. Um, obviously, people who believe in a far right ideology will disagree and say that no, no, we have to have free speech. It's, uh, it's the left wing extremists who, who need to be shut down. Um, and the only way I see of ever coming to a conclusion with this is through like public debate and through some kind of democratic mechanisms, um, which is, you know, how people for centuries have tried to resolve their conflicts and come to some kind of agreement. And with, with democracy, people are never always going to be satisfied with the outcome. It's, it's always going to be compromises, but that's, that's just human nature. And I think there's, there's no way around that. Um, so, so, you know, the, the internet, we thought it would be this totally international space where laws don't apply. But I think it was forgotten that the users of the internet are still human beings and human beings still live in a country and are still subject to the laws of the jurisdiction that they live in. Mm. Um, and so, so I think technologists still have to somehow face up to that fact and probably will have to get technologists together with sociologists and with political scientists and the other people who've been studying the human side of this for a long time and try to join forces because that there's no there's not going to be a pure technology solution to this i think it's it's going to have to involve people and debate and messiness just because that's the way humans are right so uh, it's a very important topic and uh, we'll continue to um be very impactful in the coming years, uh, I'm sure. Um, it definitely yes. seems like an important thing that we have to figure out, and and we really don't have the solutions yet. Right. Well, we'll see what the future holds. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kleppmann, uh, for this interview, and uh, uh, I hope uh, you have many prolific uh, is ahead uh, of in academy and elsewhere uh, to do your great work. So thank you again. Thanks for having me in the interview. It was good fun.